Good afternoon. I'm Craig Calhoun, the director of the LSE. And once again, the LSE makes me proud with this excellent turnout for this afternoon's event. Today, we are pleased to have an event sponsored by LSE's European Institute, the APCO Worldwide Perspectives on Europe Lecture Series. We're very grateful to APCO for their continued support of this series. The event is also organized in conjunction with the German Student Society at the school. And we are grateful for their help in making the event possible and their attendance today. As the schedule for today is quite tight, I'll keep my remarks brief. It is a great honor to welcome Dr. Philip Rossler to the LSE today. Dr. Rossler, as I am sure you already know, is the Vice Chancellor and Federal Minister of Economics and Technology of Germany. He also serves as the Chairman of the Free Democratic Party, has previously been the Minister of Health, and is a key political leader in Lower Saxony. Given the continued economic challenges which Europe faces, the lecture here at the LSE this afternoon by Dr. Rossler could not be more timely. For those in the audience who are Twitter users, let me remind you that the hashtag for today's event is hash LSE Rossler. I'm sorry, there will not be an umlaut. As usual after the lecture, there will be the chance for you to put your questions to the Vice Chancellor, but now will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Rossler to the LSE to deliver his lecture entitled Strengthening Competitiveness and Growth in Europe. Dr. Rossler. Okay. I hope I have good insurance, but okay, so. Okay. So, Professor Calhoun, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much for the kind introduction and above all for the opportunity to talk with you about Europe. Hardly any venue could be more appropriate than the London School of Economics, one of the most politically influential universities in the world. As a German liberal, I feel particular affinity with the LSE. This is where Lord Dahrendorf and Friedrich August von Hayek did much of their work. Even today, their ideas remain the key to strengthening competitiveness and growth in Europe. At heart, this is not about a mathematical model. It is about nothing less than our social vision of Europe. Only a liberal Enlightened Europe can pave the way for a stability and growth union. People need freedom to be creative. This creativity generates diversity. And competition is the best way to make sure that our diversity benefits the whole of society. In your country, the home of David Hume, John Locke, Adam Smith, this respect for personal freedom, for civil rights, and fair competition is firmly rooted. So often, Britain has stood up for these profoundly European values, and that is good for all of us. It is, however, crucial that we assert our values together as European partners. This includes making compromises, give and take. In the long run, cherry picking is not the way to run a good partnership. We share a common goal, strengthening competitiveness and growth in Europe. I'm convinced that the reforms begun in the Eurozone will lead to a European stability and growth union which will strengthen the European Union as a whole. In the current debt and growth crisis in the Eurozone, we need the right diagnosis and an effective therapy if we are to see a successful recovery. My diagnosis is clear. 
we face a grave crisis of confidence. Much of the trust in sound fiscal policy and robust competition mechanisms has been lost. For years, the member states of the Eurozone have breached the criteria jointly agreed at Maastricht. In fact, even Germany has been known to do this. The promise of stability made at Maastricht has never really been kept. And confidence is also lacking in the international competitiveness of certain member states. Necessary structural reforms have been put off for too long in too many countries, particularly on the labor markets, but also in public administration and market deregulation. In the first few years, everything seemed to go well. The introduction of the euro led to unprecedented low interest rates. For a time, this boosted economic growth. Yet, the scope offered by the favorable financing conditions was not used to undertake the necessary structural reforms or to make sustainable investments in education, research, or infrastructure. Instead, the low interest rates generated by the monetary union were simply consumed. Sovereign debts piled up. The end result was misallocations of resources and speculative bubbles. So, the current recession in some Euro countries is not a cyclical crisis. It is not due to lack of demand. Rather, it is the result of deliberately breaking monetary union rules, of short-sighted financial and economic policy. And it is also the outcome of wrong incentives with action and liability for that action increasingly drifting apart, especially in the banking sector. The structural causes cannot be simply remedied through debt-fueled spending programs. The only thing that will help is substantive reforms. The member states must be resolute as they consolidate their budgets. They must strengthen their competitiveness through more open, better functioning markets. It is a bit like sport. You don't get fit by doping. You do it by training and training hard. You can only expect help if you do something in response that also holds for Greece. Future aid payments should therefore be administered via an escrow account with an independent trustee. That would improve oversight and transparency. It would also underscore our need for sustainable finances and growth. Both form part of one and the same strategy. They are not alternatives. After all, sound public finances make for long-term confidence and growth is only possible with confidence. We have already made some headway in this direction in the Eurozone. Many countries are finally getting serious about balancing their books. The budget deficits in the Eurozone have almost halved since 2010. Current account deficits are on the decline in the Eurozone. Unit labor costs are going down in the crisis countries. And this success is meeting with a response. Markets regain confidence in countries that do their homework. Interest differentials to Germany are narrowing. We can see this in Ireland in particular, but also in Portugal. We saw something similar in Germany almost 10 years ago in 1999. The Economist called Germany the sick man of the euro. We were suffering from long-lasting structural stagnation. With extensive reforms 
particularly on the labor market, we got moving again. By 2005, the economist was already marveling at Germany's surprising economy. Willingness for reform and determination pay off in the end, but half-hearted or half-finished reforms go nowhere. They undermine confidence even more. Without the fortitude to keep going, until success has been achieved, all we have left to remember are the hardships. The population will then be averse to reform for years to come. In fact, we should always remember that the markets deal in expectations. As a result, when reforms are done well, they quickly meet with a response. Even if the measures adopted will only take full effect over time. And a country convinces the markets with credible reforms. Its creditworthiness improves, and with that, its interest rates and credit rating. Credible and resolute policies aimed at sound budgets and keen competitiveness can restore lost confidence. Ireland is a good example. On the other hand, you cannot inspire confidence with mere declarations of intent and half-hearted codes of conduct. You must fill the rules with life from the outset. If you want to be fit, joining a fitness club is not enough. You must actually turn up and do your exercises. With a triad of consolidation, structural reforms and short-term fiscal stabilization measures under the FSF and ESM, we have set off on a clearly charted course out of the crisis. The reforms we have begun the Eurozone will lead to a European Stability and Growth Union and will strengthen the EU as a whole. Now, we need to see a consistent implementation of these measures by all the stakeholders. What we do not need is one novel idea after another conjuring up ever more complicated coordinating procedures for Europe. In fact, as I'm speaking to the elite economists of the future, so you, let me ask you a question. Can anyone stand up? I hope not. And explain all the mechanisms for coordinating economic and financial policy in Europe and how they interact. Two-pack, six-pack, the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, the Euro Plus Pack, the Growth Pack, the fiscal compact, and so on. What I'm saying is this. Our main problem in the Eurozone is not a lack of rules. Rather, we are not doing enough to implement them. That is what we have to focus on. New proposals only make sense if they reinforce current procedures and their implementation. Europe must prove that also keeps to rules, treaties, and agreements. But let us also look well beyond monetary policy. Beyond the crisis, where does the economic future of Europe lie? How can we make Europe even stronger in international competition? I think we should start by going back to the centerpiece of the European Economic Union, the single market. We can only play a fast, dynamic game on a good pitch. So the single market remains the best long-term growth program for Europe. But this sustainable growth program doesn't have to come at the price of economic amphetamines like an expansionary monetary policy or excessive debt. Britain, like Germany, sends much more than half of its exports to countries of the European single market. The single market has created jobs, growth, and prosperity 
in our countries. So after more than 20 years, we now need to remove the remaining barriers. The single market is a project for all the member states. Despite all the focus on the urgent need for reform in the Eurozone, the European Union is made up not of 17 member states, but of 27 and soon even 28. The structure of Europe is not set in stone. It must keep developing. This can mean a different intensity of cooperation in individual areas. But every stage of cooperation must always be open to everyone. When we launch new measures in the Eurozone, for example, the others must be able to join in later on. Every measure must meet opt-in criteria. This is the only way Europe can continue to function as a powerful force for integration. Europe's strength is its diversity. Europe lives from the various ideas and solutions its member states can contribute. It's a bit like football. You cannot win if your team only has strikers or defenders. The blend is what counts. And team play is what gets results. We in Europe need a blend of diversity and the single market that will promote the mutual exchange of ideas. That is what inspires creativity, innovation, and commercial success. This is why close macroeconomic policy coordination, particularly in the Eurozone, is necessary and right, just like strengthening competition. Of course, coordination and regulation are not ends in themselves. Rather, the member states must grasp and shoulder their own responsibility. Diversity in unity means sharing the same basic values while leaving room for different cultures. That is one of Europe's strengths and we must continue to build on it in future. This is also a political necessity because in many member states the European Union is suffering from a loss of public confidence. Europe will not regain this confidence with centralism. Only competition between different ideas can give us the impetus we need and bring about the best outcome. Fine words alone will not do. We need a Europe we are committed to with our hearts and minds. This is why Europe must reform. We must show our citizens, and particularly our younger generation, the benefits of Europe by giving them genuine prospects for the future. That brings us back full circle to reform policy, which I am now looking forward to discussing with you. So, thank you very much for your attention. Would you like your translation? We're inviting a translator to join us because, as you can tell, I speak American and not English. <laughs> but it's wonderful to be able to thank Dr. Rossler for this speech and to open the floor for questions from the audience. When you speak, please wait for one of the stewards in a red shirt to bring the microphone and please tell us your name and affiliation. Questions? In the front here. Vice Chancellor Rossler, uh, considering the uh, Securities Markets Program and the new uh, OMD, the Outright Monetary Transactions Program, how close is the Eurozone to getting to uh, monetary financing that's prohibited in the treaties, and where would you draw the red line? Thank you. Right, what? Okay. We, you use the translate because it's better to, to answer the translate because it's very important. Your question and my answer is very important as well. And we have so many journalists. No, we have so many journalists with us. So if I say the wrong word, 
they will kill me in Germany. So <laughs> please allow me to use my, my, my colleague of the university. Let them kill me instead, yeah? Yes, it's, uh, I think it's a good idea. Thank you very much. You. <laughs> I'm all a good friend. Thank you very much. So say goodbye at the end of the... So, also, es wurde ja gefragt nach den OMT-Programmen und äh, ob damit gegen die Verträge verstoßen wird. Ich habe den Präsidenten der EZB, Präsident Draghi, immer so verstanden. Erstens, dass überhaupt nur ein Anleihenankauf möglich ist, wenn ein Land und ein Programm steht, also unter bestimmten sehr harten Bedingungen. Und zweitens hat er immer wieder betont, dass ein Anleihenankauf keine Alternative zu strukturellen Reformen sein kann. Und es gilt ja auch die Unabhängigkeit der EZB. Und es gibt auch nur eine einzige Aufgabe, die die EZB hat, nämlich Erhalt der Geldwertstabilität. Und wir gehen fest davon aus, dass sich der Präsident und die EZB sich ausschließlich um genau diese Aufgabe widmen wird. Well, the question was about the OMT programs and about whether they are breaching the treaties or not. And I understand the president of, of the ECB, uh, Mr. Draghi, in this way that he has made quite clear that bonds can only be bought up by the ECB if the countries, respective countries, are subject to a program. In other words, if they're subject to tough conditions. And the second point he makes is that these purchases are no alternative to structural reforms. Now, the ECB is independent, and it only actually has one task, and that is to ensure monetary stability. And we are convinced that the ECB will continue to perform this task. Thank you. The front the right. David Marsh from OMPFIF in London. Um, a few months ago, you said that uh, a, the possibility of Greece leaving the euro area had lost its terror. Ein Austritt hätte sein Schrecken verloren. That's what you said. Uh, it, it sounds far better in German than in English. Uh, uh, the, the question is a, a technical question. According to the legal experts in your ministry, if Greece were to leave the euro, if that were to happen, would they have to leave the European Union uh, at the same time? Uh, and, and do you think that the world could somehow cope with that extraordinary catastrophe of Greece leaving both monetary union and the European Union. Anders als 2010 haben wir ja nicht nur Reformkurse angestoßen in vielen europäischen Staaten. Fast alle 25 von 27 haben beispielsweise jetzt auch vor den Fiskalpakt selber mit zu übernehmen, also zu ratifizieren. Gleichzeitig verpflichtet man sich damit ja, künftig keine neuen Schulden zu machen und eben dafür strukturelle Reformen zur Stärkung der wirtschaftlichen Wettbewerbsfähigkeit. Und weil das Zeit braucht, bis solche Reformen wirken, haben wir Stabilisierungsmaßnahmen wie EFSF und ESM. Und das zeigt, dass die Situation gänzlich anders ist als 2010, wo ein Austritt irgendeines Staates erhebliche Schwierigkeiten, ein Schrecken, mit sich gebracht hätte. Also, finde ich, sind wir schon auf deutlich besserem Wege als noch damals. Und ähm, die Frage, die sich ja jetzt stellt, ist, wenn Sie ein neues Regelwerk aufgestellt haben, als Ersatz für die verloren gegangenen Maastricht-Kriterien, dann kann dieses System nur wirken, wenn Sie auch glaubwürdig auf deren Einhaltung bestehen. Nur das führt zu Autorität nach innen, dass andere auch ihre Reformen weitermachen und führt zur Glaubwürdigkeit nach außen, zum Beispiel aus dem Blick der Finanzmärkte. Wenn Sie den Fehler ein zweites Mal machen, tolle Regeln aufstellen, wie damals die Maastricht-Kriterien, aber dann nicht deren Einhaltung kontrollieren, dann wird das erst recht zu Schwierigkeiten führen innerhalb der Eurozone. Und die Glaubwürdigkeit, das ist das Entscheidende und das wird sich ja dann zeigen, auch bei dem jetzt zu erwartenden Bericht der Troika selber. Well, unlike the situation back in 2010, we have not only initiated programs to reform in the member states, but 25 out of 27 member states have, uh, are signing up and intend to ratify the fiscal compact. So uh, this means that not only do they want to take on 
new debts, but rather they also want to undertake structural reforms to improve their competitiveness. Now, of course, such reforms take time to impact, and therefore uh, we have we can bridge that time with the, the measures under the ESFSF and the ESM. So it's a different situation from what we had in 2010 when leaving might well have been a disaster. We're now much better off. Now the question, of course, is what happens next? We have the new rules, which have replaced the mastery criteria, which we, which we, have, which we have lost. But these rules will only... We need to adhere to these rules if we are to retain our credibility and to retain our credibility not only internally within the EU, within the Member States, but also externally in terms of the financial markets. So now the question is what happens the second time round with the new rules? Will they be adhered to? Will we have that credibility or will we lose that credibility in the Eurozone? And one key factor in whether that credibility is retained or not will be the report from the Troika we expect very soon. <laughs> no, sorry, but I, I think I have answered the question because... because the yes. The question, if Greece has to leave, will be answered after the Troika report. First of all, so on the second is, um, I'm convinced that it's not necessary because we have many member states in between the European Union, and they are not member of the eurozone. So you can see there are different ways and different currencies. So that is not the problem. But the problem is what will happen if they, if we decide that they did not make the reform. That, that, that was the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a second chance. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. The woman will wipe the back. Hi, my name is Angelica Finaleg. I'm a prospective student. Um, do you think that uh, the monetary union uh, will move towards a fiscal union as well in the near future? Zunächst einmal glaube ich, dass wir deutlich mehr Integration brauchen, als wir sie heute haben auf europäischer Ebene. Integration heißt für mich Abgabe von Souveränität, also von nationaler Souveränität, auf eine europäische Ebene. Bevor man sie abgibt an eine gleich wie geartete neue europäische Behörde, plädiere ich sehr stark dafür, dass man erstmal ein gemeinsames europäisches Regelwerk schafft, zum Beispiel in gemeinsamen Fragen der Finanzpolitik, aber auch der Wirtschaftspolitik. Und diesem Regelwerk wäre ich gerne bereit, mich unterzuordnen. Es hängt natürlich auch vom Regelwerk selber ab. Aber dem Grundprinzip nach ist das, glaube ich, der richtige Weg, zu mehr Integration zu kommen, zu einer Vereinheitlichung der gemeinsamen wirtschafts- und finanzpolitischen Ziele. Und ein Stück weit ist der Weg auch schon gegangen mit dem Fiskalpakt, wo zwei Ziele ja festgeschrieben sind. Zum einen die haushalterische Stabilität, zum anderen die notwendigen strukturellen Reformen zur Stärkung der wirtschaftlichen Wettbewerbsfähigkeit und ich finde, auf dem Weg muss man weitergehen. Man muss die Regeln noch fester fassen als bisher und vielleicht eines Tages auch etwas haben, die beginnen mit einer Wirtschaftsverfassung, um dann vielleicht auch weitere Elemente dann später hinzuzunehmen. Well, the first thing is that we need more integration, much more integration before we can get there. And much more integration implies, of course, a renunciation of national sovereignty to uh, a European level. And so far, we have seen governments, uh, be, sorry, before governments will give up the sovereignty, before the nation states will give up their sovereignty, then we need common rules at European level on fiscal policy, on economic policy. And depending on what shape those rules actually take, I would be prepared to subscribe to them if we had a common economic policy, uh, common economic project, uh, objectives, common monetary objectives. And in fact, we already have this to some extent in the form of the fiscal compact where states are signing up to budgetary stability, where they are signing up to 
structural reforms to increase their economic competitiveness. So that process can continue. The, work, the rules can be tightened further. We can end up with an economic constitution for Europe. And then we can see where we go on from there. In the gray in the center here. Walter Schelke from the European Institute at LSE. Um, Minister Rizzo, I still try to get my head around uh, your proposal to send whole countries into a fitness studio, but I did understand that you don't want to give doping like, you know, support subsidies and so on to the economy. Now, your government has uh, operated the biggest bailout, banking bailout program in the entire European Union. So, I somehow wonder whether you have double standards. So the the banks can get doping, uh, governments can't. And the funny thing is the banking system in Germany is still not very healthy uh, for all the doping it has got. So what are your ideas about uh, changing something in the German banking system and treating them perhaps uh, with the same fervor as you would like to treat countries? Also man hat sich damals ja während der Finanzkrise 2008, 2009 dazu entschieden, bestimmte große Banken zu stabilisieren. Damit einhergehend, und das wird auch in Zukunft nicht anders sein, sind immer Restrukturierungsmaßnahmen. Das heißt also, wir achten schon darauf, nicht nur den Banken einfach Geld zu geben, sondern dafür zu sorgen, dass sie selber auch strukturelle Reformen umsetzen, also teilweise auch ganze Geschäftsfelder abgeben. Da sind wir gerade dabei, zum Beispiel bei dem wichtigen Thema Landesbanken. Das machen wir auch nie alleine, sondern immer gemeinsam mit der Europäischen Kommission. Die Frage Doping heißt für uns, dass Strukturreformen der entscheidende Punkt sind und nicht einfach nur oder gar schuldenfinanzierte Wachstumspakete. Wenn Sie nur Geld in die Hand nehmen würden und in marode Strukturen hineingeben, wird am Ende kein Wachstum mehr herauskommen können. Sondern der bessere Weg ist, zunächst einmal zu Strukturreformen zu kommen und dann muss man die reformierten Strukturen natürlich mit realwirtschaftlichen Leben selber füllen. Aber das ist die richtige Reihenfolge. Und ich habe es deswegen betont, weil häufig eher nur nach Wachstumspaketen gerufen wird und man eher die Wachstumspakete braucht, um Strukturreformen zu vermeiden. Das Ende wird aber dann noch schwieriger werden und deswegen lehnen wir einen solchen Weg dann selber ab. Well, back then in the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, the decision was taken to rescue uh, certain large banks. And at the same time, these banks were not just given money, but they were also required to restructure. And together, particularly with the European Commission, we are forcing certain banks, particularly the Landesbanken in Germany, to give up certain fields of their activity, for example, as a result of this restructuring. Now, you mentioned doping as well. And the point is that the crucial thing is to undertake the structural reforms, not to uh, do, give uh, debt-fueled stimulus, stimulus packages to the economy. Because if you pump money into rotten structures, you're not going to have any positive outcome from that. Rather, the first thing you need to do is to reform the structures, get the right structures in place, and then to fill them with life. That is the correct order in which to work. So that's why I'm, I'm emphasizing again and again, this point again and again, because people call for stimulus packages for the economy, they're doing so in order to postpone and avoid any need for structural reforms. If we go down that road, we will be worse off. This is the LSE. There are always follow-up questions. Okay. Das ist im Parlament bei uns nicht anders. Deswegen will ich es noch mal versuchen. Also zunächst mal habe ich ja geantwortet auf die Bankenfrage, dass natürlich Restrukturierungsmaßnahmen immer mit vorgesehen sind. Und das heißt Aufgabe von ganzen Geschäftsbereichen. Wir diskutieren mit einzelnen Landesbanken, ob sie zum Beispiel ihr Bauspargeschäft, was sie auf Landesebene teilweise ausüben, nicht künftig abgeben müssen. Also Hilfen bekommen bei uns Banken nur, wenn sie im Gegenzug dabei zur Restrukturierung dann selber kommen. Ich finde das auch der richtige Weg. Gleichzeitig fordern wir auf europäischer Ebene gemeinsam 
viel höhere Eigenkapitalanforderungen, als es bisher eben der Fall gewesen ist. Auch das müssen die Banken ja zwischenzeitlich vorweisen. Also es ist nicht so, dass wir einfach nur Geld zu den Banken gegeben haben, mit dem Hinweis, sie wären systemrelevant, sondern das Geld, was sie bekommen haben, die Hilfen, die sie bekommen haben, als Überbrückung, soll nur Zeit gewinnen. In der Zeit müssen sie ihre strukturellen Reformen am Ende umsetzen. Das ist letztlich so ähnlich wie auf europäischer Ebene auch. Wir fordern Strukturreformen. Und weil wir wissen, dass sie eben eine Zeit lang brauchen, bis sie wirken, haben wir Stabilisierungsmaßnahmen wie EFSF und ESM selber, bei denen wir hohe Bürgschaften selber eingehen. Okay. Well, it's just like in German Parliament, so I'll try again I'll have, I, um, about the banks. I hope I made it clear that we're not just giving, we haven't just given money to the banks. Rather, we have given them money and required, them, uh, required that they restructure in return. For example, we've We're requiring that they give up certain fields of their business. The Landesbank in Germany may, are being required, for example, to give up things like their building society activities. So the banks only get assistance if they restructure. And really, that's, uh, uh, we're also doing that at EU level as well, because we're increasing the capital adequacy regulations. So the banks are also having to respond there. We're not simply giving money to banks because they're systemically relevant, but rather we're, give, we're helping them to gain time, to bridge the time in which they can restructure. And this is very similar to what we're doing at European level. We're requiring countries to undertake structural reforms. That takes time, and therefore we have the mechanisms we have helped to guarantee, such as the EFSF and the ESM. Okay. Right. And the grey sweatshirt in the second row of the balcony. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Henrik Leitenberger from King's College London. I have a question regarding uh, the German approach uh, to European politics. It has been, the, um, the federal government has been criticized several times by the European partners for undertaking measures only as a sort of ultima ratio, um, by effectively uh, only enforcing measures when it really there is no, um, there's really no escape to do otherwise. And um, is Do you take these criticisms to be valid um, from, from your part? I mean, it was, re it was uttered in regards to uh, a permanent European stability mechanism to which uh, uh, the, the Chancellor has a long time resisted. And um, basically, yeah, basically do, you, do you think that, um, do, you, do you take these criticisms, do you regard them as valid? And uh, even if not, what do you think are the next, going to be the next ultima ratio measures to take uh, in the future? Also, zunächst einmal gibt es oft unterschiedliche Auffassungen innerhalb der Europäischen Union, auch innerhalb der Diskussion der Eurozone. Wir sagen auch nicht, dass der Weg, den wir vorschlagen, der allein selig machende Weg ist. Auch der ist nicht ganz einfach. Aber bei den großen zwei Linien, die es gibt, glauben wir schon, dass die Argumente da doch eher auf unserer Seite liegen. Es gibt ja die Alternative, die wird eher im angloamerikanischen Raum auch verfolgt, bei der gesamten Bewältigung der Eurozonenkrise die Schuldenlast durch Geld drucken, durch Einsatz der Zentralbank, dann selber zu senken. Aus unserer Sicht führt das zu Inflation, was übrigens auch nicht so häufig bestritten wird. Und insofern muss einem das durchaus zu so denken geben, weil das ein großes Problem für uns selber ist. Und der andere Weg, den wir fordern, keine neuen Schulden, dafür strukturelle Reformen, um danach Impulse für Wachstum geben zu können, zeigt ja bereits seine ersten Erfolge, ist also nicht mehr bloß eine Theorie, sondern wir sehen es in Portugal, wir sehen es auch in Ansätzen in Spanien oder in Italien. Insofern ist der Ansatz, den damals die Frau Bundeskanzlerin, die Bundesregierung insgesamt hatte, zu sagen, das ist ein Weg, den wir für richtig halten, jetzt im Nachhinein ja bestätigt worden. Ob es überhaupt in der politischen Debatte gut ist, Dinge für immer und ewig zu 100 Prozent auf alle Zeiten auszuschließen, das muss man sowieso sich angucken. Und falls es Ihnen aufgefallen sein sollte, die Bundesregierung hat seit ungefähr zweieinhalb Jahren nicht mehr den Begriff alternativlos benutzt, ähm, sondern sagt, ohne sinnvolle oder denkbare oder vorstellbare Alternative. Also auch wir haben dazugelernt. Well, of course, different people have different views about how the EU or the Eurozone should uh, continue. And I'm not saying that our way is the only way. It's certainly not an easy one, but I do think that we have certain arguments on our side. One alternative approach would be more like the, the Anglo-American approach, in which the central bank 
prints money and tries to stimulate the economy in that way. We get the feeling that that can fuel inflation, and some people, some economists may agree with us on that. Uh, but anyway, um, rather, we believe rather than going, that by the, going, to going down that road, we believe the right way is to go in for budget consolidation, structural reforms by budget consolidation, thereby creating scope for growth. And that can work if you look at Portugal, it's happening there. And to some extent in Spain or Italy as well. And that is why the Chancellor believes, and Germany believes, that the way we are proceeding is confirmed by events. And also, I think, in, if you look at the political debate and the political process, it's not always good to entrench yourself 100% in a position and to reject every possible alternative to that. And one of the Chancellor's words which she used to use uh, was alternative laws in German and something that may be familiar to British uh, people with a longer memory as there is no alternative. And Tina, exactly, Tina. And um, we've moved on from that. She no longer, the Chancellor no longer says alternative laws, Tina. Rather, she says something like unimaginable or inconceivable. So, as you can see, we're learning too. Thank you. The woman in green. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Katerina, and I'm the vice president of the LSE Hellenic Society. I read Greek society. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, uh, dear Dr. Rusler, um, in your speech you have um, spoken quite extensively about liberalism and honouring diversity in Europe, yet you have spoken about countries um, such as Greece um, doing their homework, um, if I'm correct, that's a phrase you quite use. Um, for me, it seems that you are quite alluding to a system of command and economic obedience. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask whether that was what you meant. And secondly, I would like to ask whether you think it is correct to disregard the social implication of structural reform packages, especially in countries um, like Greece. Ich war nicht nur in Spanien und Portugal mit jeweils Wirtschaftsdelegationen, sondern auch in Griechenland. Und wir haben ein paar Reformen vereinbart, von denen wir eigentlich gemeinsam überzeugt gewesen sind, dass sie ihren Beitrag dazu leisten, zur wirtschaftlichen Wettbewerbsfähigkeit zurückzukommen, um aus den selber gemachten Schulden auch selber wieder durch eigenes Wachstum herauszukommen. Warum benutze ich den Begriff, Sie müssen jetzt Ihre Hausaufgaben machen? Weil wir ein paar Dinge vereinbart haben, die trotz mehrfachen Nachfragens, Nachhakens, nicht umgesetzt wurden. In persönlichen Kontakten mit meinem damaligen Wirtschaftsminister, Kollegen Herrn Krisikoides, aber auch mit der Regierung insgesamt. Und vor allem ging es darum, eine Förderbank aufzubauen, so wie wir sie in Deutschland haben mit der KfW, die nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg erheblich mit dazu beigetragen hat, dass wir so etwas wie eine mittelständische Struktur aufbauen konnten. Da gab es viele Zusagen, gab es auch viele Treffen und jedes Mal, wenn wir uns mit den Kollegen getroffen haben, hat sich der Ansprechpartner geändert. Und wenn man mal sieht, wir haben sogar schriftliche Vereinbarungen getroffen, mein Ministerkollege und ich, was daraus geworden ist, dann ist eigentlich wenig bis gar nichts umgesetzt worden. Und das ist auch keine persönliche Beleidigung, wenn die Sachen nicht umgesetzt werden, sondern ich glaube nur, wenn man sie nicht umsetzt, wird es schwierig, zur wirtschaftlichen Leistungsfähigkeit zurückzukommen, um so aus den Schulden dann rauszukommen. Durch reines Abwarten wird es nicht gelingen. Nun hoffen wir sehr, dass die neue Regierung, mein bisheriger Kollege ist nicht mehr Teil der Regierung, die Reformen jetzt anders umsetzt als die vorherige. Aber die Zielsetzung muss weiterhin bleiben, dass die Reformen umgesetzt werden. Wir sehen die Schwierigkeiten, die die Menschen haben, wenn die Gehälter gekürzt werden, wenn die Renten gekürzt werden, aber wenn die, um das Wort mal zu nehmen, Alternative wäre, man lässt nach, zum Beispiel bei der Frage Haushaltskonsolidierung, dann wird das Ergebnis nicht sein, dass das Leiden geringer wird, sondern es wird ein, zwei Jahre später noch viel schlimmer werden, weil sich von den Strukturreformen nichts, aber auch gar nichts bewegen wird. 
und um mir gleich noch mehr Freunde zu machen. In Italien war es so, dass man sehr lang, dass man erst ein Sparpaket vereinbart hatte, dann hat die EZB angefangen, Anleihen zu kaufen, die Zinsen sind gesunken, das heißt, der Druck ist sofort reduziert worden auf Italien und damals noch Herr Berlusconi hat dann sofort auch das Sparpaket gelockert. Also die Gefahr, dass wenn der Druck weg ist, dass man dann mit den Reformen sofort aufhört, die ist relativ groß und in vielen Staaten vorhanden. Auch in Deutschland. In guten Zeiten kriegen sie nie eine Reform durch. Immer nur in schwierigeren Zeiten, weil sie dann sagen können, wenn wir das jetzt nicht machen, wird es noch schwieriger. Well, I've visited various countries in the Eurozone, for example Spain and Portugal, and I've also taken a business delegation to Greece as well. And when I was there, we agree, made, reached agreements on various measures uh, in order to help boost competitiveness in Greece, so that Greece would be able to grow itself out of the debts it had made itself. And that's what I mean by doing the homework. We agreed on various things, and despite us coming back to the Greeks time and again, we found that what we agreed was not actually done in practice. And at the time, for example, I agreed with Minister Chrysogoidis, uh, who was the, my counterpart in the government at the time, that Greece would set up a bank to support its small and medium-sized business sector, like the, what we have in Germany, the KfW, which really helped our, our Mittelstand to grow after the Second World War. And we kept, every time we, we met with the Greeks, um, it was a different partner each time, but every time we met with the Greeks, Uh, we kept on asking about this, and we had the agreement in writing, but to be honest, little has, uh, the, what has been put down in paper has not uh, moved from that paper and turned into action. So, I mean, I'm not personally insulted that people don't fulfill the agreements with me, but the point is that if the country doesn't do what it needs to do, it is not going to be able to grow out of its debt under its own steam. And um, we can... We'll have to see now, of course, we've got a new Greek government, we've got a new counterpart to, to my position, so we'll have to see whether they do act. And we'll have to see um, whether the, wh what happens, particularly as I'm quite aware of uh, what you mentioned about the social side, we see the difficulties with the declining pensions and so on. However, if what happens is we simply relax our efforts to reform, Well, the country relaxes its efforts to reform, and then um, uh, to reform its budgets and so on. It, because of these social problems, it not, won't lead to less suffering in the long term. Rather, what's going to happen is a year or two down the road, the situation is going to be even worse if the country doesn't undertake its structural reforms. Now, maybe it's time to, for, my, for me to make myself even more friends around this room by turning to Italy as well. I'll give you another example. Italy agreed on, a, on an austerity package. And then the ECB started buying up Italian bonds. As a result, Italian interest rates dropped. And the pressure also dropped. Uh, the, it was the Berlusconi government at the time. It immediately responded by relaxing his work on the austerity package. If the pressure is not there, the reforms will not come. And that's not just, just a question of the countries I talked about. It's a question of many countries as well. It's true of Germany too. Reforms will not come when times are good. You can only get the reforms through when times are hard. And speaking of time, we're very near the end, so I warn you, I have eight names on my list in about two minutes on the clock. The man in the blue sweater in the back. Ali Alagra, Emeritus Professor of International Economic Integration. Uh, let me digress a little bit and ask you uh, your response to those who say that all that the European Union means to us is a single market, but We want to negotiate parts of, that, of it which is useful to us and uh, get rid of those that are not useful to us. I will not mention names, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Europa ist für uns und ausdrücklich auch für mich als Wirtschaftsminister weit mehr als nur der Binnenmarkt. Also wenn man nur ein gemeinsamer Wirtschaftsraum wäre, dann wäre mir das und ich glaube auch fast allen anderen Menschen, die ich kenne, viel zu wenig. 
Und äh, ich führe ja gleich noch Gespräche mit meinen politischen Kollegen hier in, in London, um auch darauf hinzuweisen. Es ist ein wichtiger Punkt aus wirtschaftspolitischer Sicht, aber das Ziel, zu einem gemeinsamen, starken Europa zu kommen, ähm, ist noch viel größer als nur zu sagen, wir wollen eine Wirtschaftsmacht sein oder gemeinsam Handel treiben. Das gibt es in anderen Regionen auch, das gibt es in ASEAN-Regionen, das gibt es im Golf-Kooperationsrat. Sondern wir haben, glaube ich, eine spannende europäische Geschichte. Die war nicht immer friedlich. Wir haben uns alle vorgenommen, dass sie künftig friedlich sein soll. Wir vertreten gemeinsame Werte und sind deswegen deutlich mehr als nur ein Binnenmarkt. Und ähm, wir würden uns, die Bundesregierung und ich glaube auch fast alle Deutschen, würden sich wünschen, dass das auch zum Ausdruck kommt. Ein wichtiger Punkt in der Wirtschaftspolitik, deswegen habe ich ihn erwähnt, ist der Binnenmarkt, aber es ist mit Sicherheit nicht alles. Well, I think that uh, Europe for myself, for us in Germany, for many people, for me as an economics minister, is much more than just the single market. And if we were just to have a common economic area, I think that would be too little for me and I have to say for most of the people that I know. And uh, one of the things I'm doing here in London today is to meet with my political counterparts in the government here to get my message across once again that um, the economic, economic side is important, but at the same time our objective has to be a strong Europe, and that is more than just an economic association like ASEAN or the Gulf Cooperation Council, the sort of things you find in other parts of the world. And um, European history is an exciting history. It's not only a history in which Europe has been at peace. We would like a future in which Europe, Europe is at peace and which it can assert its values. And that is why Europe is much more than just the single market. And that is why Germany, German politicians want Europe to be more than just a single market. Because we believe that whilst the single market is important, it in itself is quite simply not enough. Thank you. That's an inspiring note on which I'm afraid I have to close the session because uh, the minister has a further appointment and we have a class in this room. But <laughs> <laughs> may I thank the minister for his remarks, his question and answers, and his informative discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Russell.